So in this lecture, we are going to begin our discussion of limitations to the trademark right. And the first one we're going to talk about is so-called classic or descriptive fair use. And classic fair use is a traditional part of the law of trademark and unfair competition. And it basically grasps this idea that one is still free to use a word that has protection as a mark in its original descriptive English language meaning. So in, in William R. Warner and Company versus Eli Lilly, the Supreme Court said the use of a similar name by another to truthfully describe his own product does not constitute a legal or moral wrong, even if its effect be to cause the public to mistake the origin or ownership of the product. And this idea is carried forward in Section 33b4 of the Lanham Act, which offers protection if the use of the name, term, or device charged to be an infringement is a use otherwise than as a mark of the party's individual name in their own business or of the individual name of anyone in privity with such party, right? The idea that other people may share the name of a proprietor, but more tellingly for our purposes, or of a term or device which is descriptive of and used fairly and in good faith only to describe the goods or services of such party or their geographic origin. So you see the elements. The use is not as a trademark, is made fairly and in good faith only to describe one's own goods and services. And so the classic trademark case of Zatarin's in which the court upheld a conclusion that fish fry is a protectable mark as a descriptive mark. Nonetheless, the use by the defendant was not infringing because the defendant's use of the term fish fry was used fairly and in good faith to describe their own goods, not as a trademark, but as terms of description. And the plain has no right to the original descriptive connotations of the word in question. So it's worth noting, this is not carte blanche for trademark defendants. So imagine a situation in which Tasty is a protected trademark for hamburgers. The maker and seller of Eagle Burgers is perfectly free to advertise. Try Eagle Burgers, they're tasty. That's the idea of using the term in its descriptive sense. Naturally, other competitors in the marketplace for fast food want to be able to describe their wares as being tasty. What Eagle Burgers cannot do is say, try our new tasty brand burgers, yum. That's not okay. And so the law kind of strikes this balance between preserving the availability of useful words, wanting to make sure consumers can lower their search costs by having access to advertisers who use information rich terms to describe their products. They want to be able to promote competition in this way and thereby limit the potential scope of the trademark monopoly while still ensuring that trademark rights persist in descriptive terms where appropriate, as where there is secondary meaning. Now, a tricky question that comes up in the context of descriptive fair use cases is separating a descriptive use from something that in the context of ad copy may look a little bit more like a trademark use. So there's a case from the Seventh Circuit in 1992, Sands Taylor and Wood Company versus Quaker Oats, in which the holder of the trademark for Thirst Aid sues Gatorade for its ad campaign promoting Gatorade as Thirst Aid for that deep down body thirst. Gatorade is thirst aid for the deep And so you can look at the, you know, at an example on the screen right here, where you see Gatorade touting itself as Thirst Aid. And of course, you can see the argument that Thirst Aid is a description of the Gatorade product. Are you thirsty? Well, Gatorade will aid your thirst. It is Thirst Aid for your deep down body thirst. But when you look at the ad on the screen, you see that the Thirst Aid is really displayed prominently. Gatorade is Thirst Aid prominently almost in a way that one might expect a trademark to be deployed. And so in this particular case, the Seventh Circuit said there was no fair use, that this particular use of the phrase was as an attention-getting symbol. 
In many of the ads, the words thirst aid appear more prominently and in larger type than does the word Gatorade. Given the rhyming quality of Gatorade and thirst aid, the association between the two terms created by Quaker's ads is likely to be very strong, so that thirst aid appears as a part of a memorable slogan that is uniquely associated with Quaker's product, the Gatorade product. And, you know, courts, though, will have varying results on these kinds of situations, because I think a fairly recent case from 2019 is arguably contrary to that result. In Sport Fuel versus PepsiCo, the Seventh Circuit found fair use when the holder of the Sports Fuel mark challenged Gatorade for trying to rebrand itself as Gatorade, the Sports Fuel company. And so you can see some examples of the Gatorade usage on the screen. And the Seventh Circuit said, nonetheless, sports fuel lacks the catchy, rhyming play on words at issue in Quaker Oats, so distinguishing it from the Thirst Aid case. Nothing about Gatorade's use in this context suggests that consumers would view sports fuel as a source indicator. And so query whether you agree with that one. I mean, even, even a trademark restrictionist like myself is a little bit skeptical about that one, given that Gatorade actually has a registration for Gatorade, the sports fuel company. And so it sure looks like they're using sports fuel in a trademark sense. And if, if you look at the actual registration, they disclaim the exclusive right to use the sports fuel company apart from the mark as shown you know well well great but just in terms of the word mark by itself that's four of the five words and in the actual case the court says well you know they're featuring the gatorade part a lot more prominently but it does kind of raise the question why does gatorade get to claim sports fuel as part of a mark when you have another registrant out there with the sports fuel name and you know not that sports fuel is necessarily the strongest mark in the world, but still it is a valid trademark. So anyway, the, the, the bottom line here, of course, is, is not to say whether the Seventh Circuit was right in the Thirst Aid case and wrong here or vice versa. It doesn't really matter what, what we think about any discrete case, but shows the potential for variability in these situations. And that's always the thing to keep in mind, the inherently factual question of a lot of these issues and the classic fair use application is certainly one of those.